Well, I was doom scrolling the other day. Do you know what that is? It's where you're on your phone and you just get stuck going through video after video after video, meme after meme after meme. Yeah, it's a trap. Well, I was doom scrolling the other day and this little video popped up on my phone and it was two guys talking to each other and the one guy says, I heard that you're thinking about going to church. And the other guy, who's this kind of straight, talking, tough farmer guy, he says, well, who's got that kind of money? <laughs> and it kind of stopped me dead for a minute. Like, what did he mean by that? It doesn't, it doesn't cost anything to go to church, does it? A person once told me that they don't go to a neighboring church anymore because at that church, they just want your money. Someone once told me that they started going to church for years and years, but then they got this new minister in the church, and that new minister preached about stewardship in the first month of his new tenure. For the record, it's been six months. Okay? All of this highlights for me the fact, well, two facts. Number one, that stewardship is a sensitive topic, and Number two, that it's often misunderstood. So today, I want to walk us quickly through five stewardship myths. So buckle up. The first myth that comes to mind for me is that tithing is the same as membership dues. I've often had people say to me, if I go to your church, does it cost anything? And that always kind of catches me off guard. Like, no, we... There's no dues to go to church. Now, you may have heard it said that there's no such thing as a free lunch, and that is true. Everything in life comes at a cost, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to pay that cost. Take church, for example. It costs you nothing to attend. There might be some cab fare, maybe some gas to get here, but once you're here, there's no entrance fees. And the reason for that is because worship is not a commodity that can be sold. Worship is a right as our status as human beings made in the image of God. We are his children. It is our right to worship. Now, Jesus often made this clear. Think of the time he cleared at the temple got the whip, he overturned those tables and got rid of those money lenders. He said, I will not have this house of God, my father's house, turned into a den of robbers. Also remember what happened on Palm Sunday, right before he even got to the temple. There's this story, he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the crowd of disciples began joyfully praising God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. They said, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd, they said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. They're overstepping here. Obviously, you don't deserve this kind of praise. Little did they understand at the time he was the son of God and in fact did deserve that kind of praise. And then Jesus says, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Worship is our right as human beings. It's, it's a natural expression of love from the created to the creator, and it's so a part of creation that Jesus says, if we don't worship, then creation itself will cry out with praise. And that's why we will never, ever charge admission at the door. We'll never have one of our larger ushers escort you out if you don't put a 50 in the plate. But if we did, I know who I'd get. Gene Jones, for sure. There's no such thing as a free lunch, but what we do here on Sunday mornings is always completely free. But that doesn't mean that it's not costly. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. 
The next stewardship myth that I want to dispel is that it's all about finances. It's all about money. Many Christians believe that stewardship only deals with money, with finances. And I can see why. When we talk about stewardship in the church, we usually talk about it being behind on the budget. We need money for a project. We definitely need more money. Stewardship is about money. Stewardship is about finances. But it's also about so much more. A good definition of stewardship is the responsible overseeing and protection of something considered worth caring for and preserving. And when it comes to Christian stewardship, well, that becomes an even greater responsibility because everything that we're overseeing and protecting is a gift that God has given to us as his created. Stewardship isn't a word that we use much outside of Christian circles these days. You don't hear it in the common vernacular out on the street. And perhaps that's because our modern philosophy is not to care for creation, but to use it up as fast, as quick as we can. Now in the Bible, stewardship is so much more than fundraising. It's about how you live your life. It's a mentality it's about how you look at the world and how you see your place in it. You see, you and I have been given this great gift. Our lives, our planet, the air we breathe, everything that we have is a gift from God. And as we have been given this great gift, God has entrusted us, just like he entrusted Adam and Eve, to care for the garden he has entrusted us to care for all that we have been given. Now, the word stewardship, it comes from the Greek word oikonomia, which sounds a lot like the word economy for good reason. It means management, particularly management of a household. We are managers. We are stewards of the time, the talents, and the treasures that God has given to us. One of the very first sermons I ever heard when I was a teenager, when I first came to Christ, was a sermon about how God's given us time, talents, and treasures. And the youth pastor got up there and said, now how do you want to use your time? How do you want to use your talents? And how do you want to use your treasures for God's kingdom? And that has stuck with me ever since I was 17, 16, 17 years old. We are managers of these gifts. We are stewards. So when we talk about stewardship, we are talking about fundraising and tithing, and we're talking about capital projects and so on. But we're talking about more than that. We're also talking about the environment and the choices that we make. The other day I said, would it be okay to have juice boxes for the kids? And they said, sure. And then a week later said, you know what? My conscience won't let us do juice boxes. We're just going to have glass, good old-fashioned glasses and bottles of juice. And I said, great, that's, that's perfect for me. But that's an example of stewardship. A very simple, practical example of stewardship. What about mental health? God has given us the ability to feel, to love, to care, to think. But how well do we guard our own mental health? How... How do we steward, how do we manage our own personal mental health? Some of us well, some of us not so well. What about our use of time? I did mention doom scrolling, right? Which personally, you know, for a few minutes isn't too bad, but for a few hours perhaps adds up to a poor use of your time. What about care for the vulnerable? The people on the margins, the people who can't care for themselves. Isn't that a stewardship, stewardship idea? Isn't that a stewardship issue? All of these things fall under the umbrella of stewardship. It's so much more than giving to a church financial budget. And this, what we're talking about here, is so vastly different than number three. 
Myth number three, that it's all about giving to the church. Now, this is an old school teaching that goes something like this. Because we are believers in Christ, because we are part of a local congregation, it's our responsibility to give to the church. And I can understand where this comes from. I probably preached that myself over the last 20 years more than once. I get this to some degree. Every year when we set that spring annual budget, we're saying we want to spend as a congregation this set amount of money on these set things in this particular way in order to further the kingdom of God. And therefore, we are voluntarily as members committing to support that financial decision. That I understand. But at the same time, at the same time, it's more biblically accurate to say that stewardship is our responsibility as the church, not to the church. You see the difference? That's because we don't go to the church. We are the church. Whenever I say to somebody, I want you to meet me at the church, I usually correct myself and I say something like, I mean the church building, where the church gathers. Because this is not a church. We might call it that, but it's not. It's the place where the church gathers. We are the church. We are not called then to give to the church. We are called to be, this is a huge distinction, a church that gives. A church who gives. And it's amazing what can happen when you change a word or two. You see, there's a huge difference between the church wants money for a new roof, which does, versus we, as the church, want to ensure that the roof doesn't leak so that we can hold Bible studies to encourage people in their faith. We can have teenagers run around in the basement. We can have kids destroy the upstairs on a Sunday morning. We can gather for worship. We can feed people at a community supper. We can, the list goes on and on. It's all about how you think about stewardship. The church wants money for a new roof or replace new roof with anything you want versus we want to do this because we have a calling and we have a mission as we talked about last Sunday. So when you look at stewardship as giving to the church, it often then leads to myth number four. And myth number four is it's someone else's problem. It's someone else's problem. Are you familiar with the term diffusion of responsibility? It's fascinating. We, as human beings, we have this thing where if you're in a small crowd, you feel very responsible for the things that happen around you. When you're in a large crowd, that responsibility is diffused and you feel very little responsibility for what happens around you. And so let's say you're out on the street and there's five or six people walking down the street and one person attacks another. It is very likely that those four people not involved, very unlikely that they will just walk on by. But if you're on a busy, busy street and something like that happens, you may not even notice. And if you do, there is a likelihood that most people will think to themselves, it's somebody else's problem. This is diffusion of responsibility. Now listen, I'm not trying to take you on an all expenses paid guilt trip, okay? And if I were, I'd charge you a fee. This is just the normal human condition. This is just the way we are wired. In my experience, if all things are equal, I have found that smaller churches 
actually give a higher percentage per person than in bigger churches. And it's not because they're better Christians, they're more spiritual, they're more holy. It's simply because they have less opportunity to say, somebody else will take care of it. Somebody else will pay the bill. So in larger churches, we need to be a little more intentional because in reality, stewardship is an important part of our spiritual journey. As we learn, with the example of Jesus Christ, to be sacrificial. And generosity is actually a discipline that takes time to develop, but it always leads to great blessings. You know, I don't think I've ever had someone come up to me and say, you know, the other day I helped so-and-so out of a predicament. You know, whether they needed some money or they needed a ride or they needed help moving a dishwasher into the house. I've never had anyone say, you know, Rev, I helped somebody out last week and I feel terrible about it. Have you ever had that feeling? I haven't. I don't know anybody who has. It is a joy in many ways to participate in what God is doing around us, to jump in and lend a hand. Generosity goes along with that. Finally, our last stewardship myth that I'd like to bust today brings us right back to the beginning. They just want your money. No, we don't. We really don't. I have to tell you, in fact, we hate, hate talking about money. We hate budgeting. We hate accounting. We hate spreadsheets. Okay, maybe this is personal. Maybe I hate spreadsheets. Maybe Denman loves them. I don't know. Denman, do you love spreadsheets? Where'd you go? No? Yeah. We don't like talking about money, folks. We really don't. And we are very, very aware that life is getting more and more expensive by the day. More and more, and when you look at your bank account after you pay your bills, there's not a whole lot left in that bank account. Believe, I understand. It, it makes us uncomfortable asking for money. It makes me uncomfortable talking about money. And it makes us so uncomfortable that Many pastors just never, ever talk about it. They ignore the topic altogether. But it's my calling. It's my responsibility to give you a full diet from the scriptures. I don't get to ignore the parts that I'd rather not preach. And the Bible says, and I'll just give you a couple verses If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? After all, our model for generosity is Jesus Christ himself. And as we read in the book of Romans, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died us. This is why we do what we do. This is why we fundraise and we make appeals and we sit through long, boring meetings about finances. Not because we love it. We do it because as the body of Christ, we want to carry on his mission in this broken world. We want to be the healers that Jesus was in this hurting world. Now, in the beginning, I said that there's no such thing as a free lunch, and that is true. We do not charge a cover fee to attend worship or youth group or even most of our many programs, our concerts and our events, and we have some pretty amazing programs, concerts and events for all ages. And at the same time, It does take a great deal of resources to make all of these ministries happen. They don't just happen by accident. Like the coffee hour or the choir, the Love Your Neighbor program, the community dinners or the youth group, 
these amazing ministries that touch so many people in Collingwood, they don't happen by accident. But here's the thing, and this is the most important thing. What we give to your church can never, ever compare to what our God has given up for us. We, and I know this is an old preacher's term, we can never outgive God. Ever. For God so loved the world, you know this one, say it with me, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Nothing that we give can ever compare to what he has given. Our salvation was purchased at such a high cost. And not one of us here has paid or will pay a single, single penny. So in a way, I think that straight-talking farmer was right. Who's got that kind of money? Not you. Certainly not me. But thanks be to God that he paid it all. Let us pray. Lord God, first of all, I thank you that the stewardship sermon is done and over for the year. (laughs) But more importantly, I, I do thank you for each person who gives so generously to the ministries of this church. I know that people have made sacrifices in order to support the good work of this congregation. I know that people have gone without certain luxuries in order to make sure that our kids are getting their Sunday school program and our seniors are being taken care of and people are being fed. So I thank you. I thank you for that amazing example of faith that I find in this congregation. I thank you for the way that you have blessed it. I thank you that we do have these amazing programs. Many churches would kill to have what we have here at First Presbyterian. I'm so grateful to be part of this. So would you continue to guide us into the future and direct us and lead us to help us know how to best be your church here in Collingwood. And may the things that we do be felt far beyond the borders of this community. We thank you for your great love. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and the life that he gave for us. That while we were still sinners, he died for us. That his love is so great, so vast beyond measure, that we can never, ever repay you for all that you have done. We ask for your forgiveness for the times where we have not been good stewards particularly of the world around us in which we live. We ask that you would guide us and lead us to be better stewards in many ways. I thank you for the leaders of this church who watch over it, for the property and the finance teams, for the session and the CE teams and so on that spend so much time nurturing and loving the people that come through our doors And that, in fact, often go out past these doors into the community with your gospel of grace and love. And so, Lord, on this Stewardship Sunday, may you soften our hearts. May you help us get over the uncomfortable nature of talking about finances and resources. And just speak to us as to how each and every one of us can participate in what you're doing in this church and beyond. We ask this in Jesus' name, and we pray together in the same way that he taught his own disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.